Hi, everybody. I'm excited today to talk about prints, multiple, Sam Francis, Roy Lichtenstein, um, art as an investment, the, the current status of the art world. It's going to be really great. All right. Here we go. There he is. <laughs> hey. Hey, hey good, good afternoon there. Good afternoon. How are you doing? I'm well, yeah. Happy it's Friday. Thank you for having me. Yes, Friday, finally some good weather. I know you're you're not here on the East Coast, but uh, finally enjoying here. Yeah, I like the hair. Cut Thank the hair you. Off. This is, uh, the, the Corona cut. It looks good. It looks nice on you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you for uh, for taking time to do this today. Um, I pulled out a bunch of print catalogs, and I'm excited to talk about, you know, some of the artists that you guys represent. Um, but first of all, just wanted to welcome everybody to the Thinking of Art call series. The the uh, the reason why I created this was really to to reach out to creatives and and artists and gallery directors and really uh, provide some education during this time of quarantine. And uh, one of my favorite galleries in New York City is David Bitterman Fine Art and Alex and I have met you, each other a long you. time. And I know his brother, Leon, a long time. So uh, just thought it was appropriate to have a conversation with you. But first, before we get into kind of some of the, the, the blue chip names that we want to hear about, can you talk about your road to uh, working full time in the art world? Obviously, you have a family that's very involved in that, but I'm curious of your of your sure. progress. Yeah. Sure. So um, as you mentioned, you know, I was kind of raised in the business. Um, but, you know, really just always grew up with an appreciation for art, art around the house. You know, we always joke, uh, I grew up with a, a, a nude portrait over the, the dining room, the family dining room table. So it never <laughs> struck me as odd. Yeah. Uh, growing up in the art world. And uh, yeah, you know, I, I went to college, studied international business and art history, kind of a mix of, you know, the, the fields I, I, I knew I'd be going into. Um, worked a little bit for the family, then left uh, to work at Artnet Auctions, mm -hmm. where I was working in their prints and multiples department, doing online auctions, kind of a little bit ahead of the curve, you know, before any of the big houses or really before anyone was, was paying that much attention online. Mm -hmm. um, had you know a, a great run there, and then uh, decided to head back to the family gallery and uh, try to really ramp up our program there. Yeah, and how many years have you been working for the family gallery? Um, up for debate, but uh, I'd say 10 professionally, 10, 12 professionally, but- uh, But know, always kind of involved with them, of course. I mean, I was, I was making frames at eight, so. Amazing. Uh, it's, it's been a long time. Well, you have a lot of knowledge that you can share with us. Um, but first of all, I want to talk about, you know, the prints and multiples. And, um, you know, I have some catalogs here that I wanted to kind of show some imagery. But can you talk about, you know, if somebody wants to buy a blue chip artist, who are some of the names that are more affordable? Um, talk about that a little bit, because obviously the higher end names are, you know, Warhol, Lichtenstein, some of those prints are, are very expensive. But who are some of the names that you would recommend or that you guys uh, represent? Um, so, you know, I always say that's the greatest, the greatest part of, of in dealing with prints and multiples is that there really is something at every level for almost everyone. So, mm -hmm. you know, like you said, there are Warhol prints that are hundreds of thousands, even millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there are Warhol prints that are 5000 7000 $8,000, which is, you know, not a small amount of money, but still... Yeah quite accessible. Uh, you, there talk, you, have, you talk about this, one of the more expensive ones? Yes, yeah, so that is Andy Warhol's Maryland portfolio. Yeah. Um, probably his most iconic work. Uh, and, you know, that that obviously ranges on the higher end of uh, what Warhol prints typically go for in the market. Yeah. That, that lot that you're looking at there is a full set, which is the 10 works from the edition mm -hmm. of 250. Uh, the fact that they're an edition of 250, meaning there are 250 editions, um, is what makes them prints and multiples rather than the paintings or the works on paper. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you know, they they trade often, they're out there in the market, and uh, everybody really enjoys them. It's a lot of people's first foray into art is seeing that image, you know. 
Yeah, I mean, I want to put up some other Warhols. I mean, this is a set of 10 as well. Yes, Warhol often worked in, in portfolios or series of 10. That is the flower set. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a set that we, we've lucky to, we're lucky to have sold quite a few times, as well as the Maryland set. So, yeah. you know, that, that is among one of the most common uh, secondary market uh, works that people are interested in acquiring. I mean, a lot of people, you know, want to get into art and want to buy art, but are really intimidated, you know, by that. And some people are, you know, will tell me, hey, I don't want to buy a print because, you know, how do I know that, you know, 250 are made or whatever the edition size is, and there aren't more in that series. So can you talk about that a little bit on the kind of... Sure. Sure. So firstly, print the way that prints are made, uh, so those works, for example, are what's called silk screen prints or mm -hmm. screen printed print, uh, prints. Mm -hmm. um, and the way those are made is each color is actually a different screen that is produced, and then the ink is rolled through that screen to achieve the work. Um, and Warhol and almost all artists, after the works were made, would destroy the screens so they couldn't be reproduced. They're all hand signed, hand numbered. Um, and I'm not sure if you're holding an auction catalog or the catalog resume there, but- The resume. Listed. The resume. Oh, that is the resume. Mm -hmm. So each one is listed exactly how many were made. Great book to yeah. have. Uh, surprisingly, only $50 at your local Barnes and Nobles or online. Uh, so always a, a fun a fun way to sort of break into the world of, of Warhol. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I, you know, they're, they're, as long as you're dealing with a trusted source, you know, a gallery that's been in business a long time or a major auction house um, who have vetted the works properly, uh, there's really no concern to be had. Um, so talk about like the price point, uh, an entry level price point of one of those prints, whether it be a flower or a Marilyn, uh, those are more on the high end, right, of Warhol's print series. Yeah, so Marilyn's will trade anywhere typically between, let's say, 75000 for the less desirable colorways, all the way up to around 300000 for the iconic pink with blonde hair or the all black and silver. Um, those tend to trade on the higher end. The flowers similarly range at, you know, maybe 50000 to 80000 uh, in really excellent condition. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned condition because that is uh, something that really affects the value of prints, right? So it's, it's what's setting one apart from all the others in the series. So you want to make sure. Yeah, I think that's a really good it. point. Um, and it's, you know, it's important whenever you're looking, whether you're looking online um, to ask those questions or, you know, ask for a condition report or have an art advisor or somebody that you really trust. Oh, to I was about to say, or somebody like yourself who can uh, walk you through it. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Um, let's talk about the Myth series. I mean, I really love this series. Um, you guys, so I wanted to see, like, Warhol was known for doing, like, sets of 10 of these series. So that's why you, you notice, like, the 10 Marilyns, the 10 Flowers, and then you have the Myths. So you have, like, the iconic, you know, Mickey Mouse. And then you have the Superman, which I think is really cool. So talk about these, because these really vary in price in the Myth series. Yes. Yeah, so while these were all released at the same time at the same price, uh, they can really vary just because, you know, the market picks and chooses or collectors rather pick and choose what they like and things have appreciated accordingly. So um, not that I'm not a huge fan of Santa, but, you know, <laughs> Santa, Dracula, you know, those are literally trading at a tenth of what Superman or Mickey would go for. Uh, you know, I actually have both Superman and Mickey in inventory right now. Uh, that, that they happen to be some of my favorites as well. I should have hung one in the background instead of a yeah. this beautiful Julian Opie. I um, love the Opie. Yeah, um, another, another fun work. Why do you think the Mickey and the Superman are the most valuable of that series? Well, when you, when you think of Warhol, right, you think of um, documenting Americana and kind of the time and, and you know, these mythical characters, you know, the, the set is called Myths and Legends. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people really, uh, the, the images resonate with a lot of people. It, it yeah. takes them back to a, a younger time or, or that time specifically in their history. Um, and, it, and, and, you know, it's, Warhol's really known as uh, an artist who really focused on icons and iconography. Um, and obviously, 
Warhol and, uh, excuse me, Superman and Mickey Mouse uh, are some of the most iconic figures. Yeah, for sure. I wanted to move to Liechtenstein. So I have the, this is the print resume, uh, the one from 1948 to 1993. So I wanted to pull out you know, this, this image from 1963. The crying um, girl. Love this. This is a print. It is. Did. So actually, it's a it's a good a good point to notice. This is something like, you know, I'm sure you you would be able to advise clients about, but um, you can notice that uh, the resume entry that you're looking at actually says uh, the correlate number is two dot one, mm -hmm. meaning it's in a second section of the resume. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason for that is because this is a different type of print. This is an offset lithograph, so these weren't originally made. You know, at the at the time of creation that. You know, Lichtenstein didn't see his market exploding and, and these being valued so highly. So unlike most of his other works that you'll see, you know, all the previous pages in that book, um, this was done more as a poster and it just became such an iconic image. People gravitated towards it and it started trading more and more. But that is not numbered. It's not from a numbered edition. It's an unknown mm -hmm. edition that they printed more and more of. Um, and that is actually one of the main reasons you want to deal with someone very reputable is that happens to be one work that is often faked. Here's like a later work. So the crying girl was from 1963. Here is one from 1990. Um, yes. Wait, is that one? Reflections on the Nerva. Yeah. yeah. From 1990. So yeah, that, that's from his reflection series, similar mm -hmm. to the Warhol series. We were just talking about myths and legends. Uh, and even more so more apropos for Liechtenstein, uh, kind of working with these images of very popular uh, comic books. Uh, that's Wonder Woman, of course. Um, and some of the other works in that series, if, if you flip mm -hmm. one more page, you'll see uh, the reflections on Crash, which has, you know, some Batman imagery in it. Mm -hmm. um, find this. But really interesting works. Um, you know, he, he used quite a, a, a different bit of mixed media to achieve those works. There's like metallic PVC layers, there's screen printed layers. Um, yeah, all that silver you see is actually, it's, it's almost like a mirror finish onto the paper. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, just, just incredible large scale prints, um, which are, of course, if it were a painting, you know, those would be well into the millions, but the fact that their additions make them a, a drop more accessible to the general public. That's a really good point. That's, you were uh, exactly what I was gonna, gonna uh, transition into. So somebody that wants a big name like Warhol or Liechtenstein or whatever, and wants to, you know, buy art, you know, some people want to buy art as an investment, some people just love it because it's beautiful, but, and some people just want to acquire names or, or have a name association um, that they respect in their collection. So talk about like the differences between, say, a, a Maryland, Maryland painting, right, versus a Maryland print and the, the difference in, in pricing? Well, you know, as we said, the Maryland prints will trade in the high five figures to the mid uh, six figures. Mm -hmm. Whereas the paintings, you're talking eight figures or more, yeah. um, or well into the eight figures. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, something you mentioned, uh, which is, you know, collectors trying to get into, into the market and really getting a gauge for how things are priced. Uh, prints are a great vehicle for that because you can see how they're trading. There's, there's, a little comfort in seeing that, you know, this Maryland trades at auction multiple times a year, it typically yeah. goes around this value uh, when it's in, you know, X condition. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's, there's an ease of entry to it. That it kind of brings down some of the, the, the barriers that, you know, the art world can sometimes be stigmatized with. Yeah, and I think the comfort that I always share with my clients is, you know, if you're buying a print, and we do, I do the due diligence with the gallery that has it or the client that has it. We can track back to see where that piece, who owned that piece in the past as well. So it's important always to do your due diligence of who owned the piece and, you know, what collection it was in, for example, and also the condition, of course. So um, I was trying to find my Wesselman book. I, I have a Wesselman book somewhere. I can't find it. But if you, if you want to talk about Wesselman's work um, as well, maybe the specific series, maybe the steel cut series or something. Um, sure. So we, we actually just had a steel cut show at the gallery uh, a little under a year ago. 
Um, and the steel cuts are really a, a, a great furthering of the discussion of pop art, right? Pop art, Warhol, Lichtenstein, you know, Wesselman as well, of course, they were all known for bringing these commercial techniques into the fine art world. Um, mm -hmm. And so with Warhol and with Lichtenstein, uh, that was screen printing and, and mass printing and be being able to mass produce images. Um, but in the 80s, uh, Wesselman started exper uh, experimenting with uh, making steel cuts, um, which were sort of these CNC machines, these laser cut machines, which could very precisely uh, cut into metal Mm -hmm. um, which he would then paint or color in various ways um, to sort of make a three-dimensional work that's almost sculptural. Um, but the way he puts it, uh, or he had put it, was that it was sort of bringing drawings to life. Um, and, and I thought that was very interesting. There's no, there's no background to the work. Uh, the wall is the background, and uh, they're, they're quite arresting when you see them. Yeah, they are. Um... What should we talk about next? Maybe Ruscha? Sure. So um, that's actually a, a great, a great jump uh, because while Warhol, Lichtenstein, and Wesselman were working, you know if on you can read that, stuff. is it backwards? Yeah, fools. Fools. So if you guys just, <laughs> um, and then this one I thought was also really good. Flagstaff. Yes. Yeah. So talk about Ruscha's work. Sure. Um, Ruscha was actually is actually one of my favorite printmakers. Uh, mm -hmm. He's still alive, so I shouldn't say was, but... Um, yeah, you too, I love, love his work. While, you know, Warhol, Lichtenstein were, were on the East Coast and bringing screen printing into the art world, into the fine art world through mass production, um, Rouché was more interested in the techniques themselves and how far they can be pushed. So mm -hmm. at the same time that, you know, Warhol's Maryland was created in 1967, uh, the print rather, um, Ruscha was working on the West Coast with the the standard, the famous the gas station image that uh, yeah. he's so well known for. Um, but rather than making many more of them and sort of mass producing that image, uh, he was trying to further the techniques themselves. So you'll notice the background has that sort of gradient uh, quality yeah. to it, um, which is a, a a printing technique called the split fountain. Uh, a little a little technical, but um, you know, and he, throughout his career, he's continued uh, to try to explore that. Uh, one of the a series he did uh, a few years later in uh, 71, I believe, mm -hmm. um, he was replacing inks with organic food substances, you know, and really using that as commentary as well. Uh, you know, one of his more recognizable images is, you know, the Hollywood sign overlooking the Hollywood Hills. Sure. Um, and he completed those works. Uh, one of them in a, a mixture of uh, caviar, and then the sky, the pink sky was, was printed with Pepto-Bismol. So uh, no not only amazing to see how the works come out um, and how they age over time, yeah. but also a little bit of commentary in there about Hollywood kind of gorging yeah. themselves. And, so and then, yeah, so talk about like the washed out effect that he used. Yeah, so, you know, there's, there's really a, a, a variety of, of, of print techniques. You know, there's etchings, monotypes, which would be one form, um, screen prints, and, and lino cuts. I mean, w without getting too technical here, uh, he was really interested in, in all these different techniques and how he can make them work. I believe that the works you're discussing, discussing are uh, lithographs, mm -hmm. um, which is sort of his go-to uh, these days and was as well back in, in in the 70s when he was still working with Tamarin Press yeah. or Tamarin Institute. Um, and then of course, we'll transition into San Francis, which I, I really, really love. Um, are there specific Francis pieces of you just did a show or an exhibition that launched right, right before the pandemic, right? At the gallery? Yeah, we've actually transitioned it to a virtual exhibition. So you can head online uh, at our website and mm -hmm. sort of poke around there and uh, actually enjoy an empty gallery, you know, without having to compete for eyes on the works. These, these um, aren't works necessarily in the show, but I just wanted to pull, you, pull these up to give you a reference of, uh, and a reminder of what San Francisco's work is like. But can you talk about like the five decades, you know, of, of work that you had in the show or that you still have? Sure. 
Yes. Um, so the San Francisco show we have up, the idea was for a bit of a survey show, which is really when you try to grab a few works um, from different periods uh, and different series of the artist's lifetime that really, so you can sort of follow their trajectory through time and, and how their style evolved and really, you know, seeing what they were interested in and what they were experimenting with. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, when you walk in the gallery, it's the, the first works are early works from the 50s, which are these sort of monochromatic, biomorphic, cell-like uh, works that he, he had started out doing. Um, and, you know, you progress through the, the different series that he had worked on, and you can start to see, you know, in later works in, when he started doing matrix paintings, as they're called, with these very intricate grid patterns uh, in the background. Yeah, um, and this, this is an example of like an, a 50s work that he did. Example. Yes, that the late 50s are probably his most sought after works. Um, yeah. That was shortly after uh, he moved to France and began, mm -hmm. you know, he was really just taken with uh, some of the modern masters and the impressionists uh, and their use of color. Um, and so while he had been exploring how light effects work, he kind of stayed tame until he moved there and started really experimenting with bold and really s strong, strong color. Um, and, you know, just seeing how, how that would arrest the viewer. Yeah, no, I love Francis's work. Um, talk about um, kind of your thoughts on the art market right now. And obviously, you know, we're all transitioning and figuring out how to do business. Um, you ha you're used to having these beautiful exhibitions in your gallery space there in New York. And now, you know, you have the virtual exhibition that's going on. But you talk about that and your thoughts on kind of your how you guys are are changing as a gallery and what your thoughts are on the future of the art market? Sure. Um, I think that, you know, while there's definitely a lot of, of, of negative things surrounding this pandemic and what it's done to different industries, mm -hmm. uh, I will say it's been a little more interesting in the art world, uh, kind of a pullback from this, you know, the, the last decade can really be uh, summed up in, in, in the term art, art fair frenzy, right? Mm -hmm. Or art fair fatigue. Uh, where, you know, the market had really been operating by almost every weekend. There was a different there major was a art fair. Oh, yeah. I, that's often where I see you most, right? Just mm -hmm. down the aisles uh, all over the world. Um, yeah. And so obviously this pandemic has changed not only people going to their local galleries and seeing shows or museums, but really not, not traveling and not having that discourse there. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, while that's a major loss to the industry, I, I do think uh, it's been interesting discussing with collectors who are just home and have a little bit more time for connoisseurship. So mm -hmm. I, I, I do think that there is something to be said for people really looking at the art a little bit more, more seriously and, and kind of seeing where, where things fit, why, why they might belong in their collections. Um, and just, you know, being yeah. able to, to really look at things. Do you think, um, what are your thoughts on the LA market versus New York? I mean, there's been so much interest in the LA market, obviously with the second year of the Freeze Art Fair. But I'm curious in your thoughts if, because of everything that's happened in New York, I um, think there's gonna be a shift in some ways to, to more, uh, I don't know, more growth in the LA market. Yeah, definitely. I, I think it's, you know, it's something that everyone, at least in New York has always wanted. Uh, we've mm -hmm. always, would love to have another art capital uh, mm -hmm. right here in the States. And it's really been amazing. You know, the last two editions, as you mentioned, of Freeze, um, and even before that, ALAC um, and the other side fairs that join it, you know, Felix um, and Spring Breakers and, and whatnot. You know, as soon as a major fair opens in a city, all these small satellite fairs pop up and, and it really becomes a destination. Um, that coupled with many major galleries opening uh, serious exhibition spaces in the city mm -hmm. have really, you know, brought the city onto the map uh, in terms of being an art world capital. Um, and I, again, I, I do think it's a it's a welcome change. It's a, a different pace than you're used to seeing in New York, London, or Paris, uh, especially Hong Kong, where there's you know galleries are spread out a bit more. You have time to go look at things and really mm -hmm. take in the city as you do so. Well, yeah, and there, you know, we have larger homes out here, so that require a little bit more art, which I think is great. Um, Let alone the, the some of the most 
amazing American artists are, you know, right there in your backyard. Yeah, that's really true. So are you hearing, you know, rumblings with certain artists that you guys are working with or people maybe thinking about, you know, moving out west or having a second home here? Is that something that, that you've been talking to certain people about or heard from your side? I'm just curious. I mean, I think, uh, you know, without being too, hmm, what's the right word? Um, <laughs> I think most New Yorkers travel to LA quite a bit, definitely those yeah. involved in the art market. So I think it's always been, you know, very bi-coastal. As, as you mentioned, my, my brother works uh, at an auction house there in LA and a lot of the art, art market in general is, is back and forth quite a bit. Uh, mm -hmm. Or you could throw Miami in the mix, obviously hosting Art yeah. Basel and whatnot. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it's a natural, it's, it's a natural departure um, and a welcome one. So you guys ask questions and then we'll, um, Alex and I will address those. So please pop up any questions, whether it be, you know, price points or any specific blue chip artists or names that you'd like to know about or, or how to care for a specific piece of art. Um, I just want to curious of your favorite artists. I mean, you're surrounded by art every day and the work that you do, but do you have any favorites? Um, I definitely have favorites. Uh, I would say from some of the pop artists we discussed, Lichtenstein has always been uh, a huge inspiration to me. Um, specifically, Why? He's, Why? Um, just the, the fact that he's one of, he's an artist who really visited art, revisited uh, many popular subjects in art history and recontextualized them uh, to sort of fit his audience and even mm -hmm. today's audience. Um, so, you know, for example, I can recall being younger and seeing my father sell, you know, and deal with Monet water lilies, uh, which are, you know, some of the most famous artworks in the world. And, you know, almost a hundred years later, Lichtenstein visited that subject and sort of made his own series um, in a in a sort of pop sensibility, uh, which which is really something special to see. You know, if you grow yeah. up, with, you know, I'm gonna pull that out and show everybody. Sure. Every series, if I find it. Um, oh, I opened right to it. Okay, here's one. Here's one. To talk about. Yes, that's actually uh, hanging in the gallery right now. The Japanese oh, bridge. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> and it's for sale today. It is. It is. <laughs> So that piece is, uh, or that work is, where's the, where are the details on that catalog here? Um, so talk about it a little bit and the size, the dimensions from 1992. Yes, so that is one of the works from the series. Um, it's rather large in size. I believe it's about 84 inches tall. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's, it's interesting in that he, he visited very late in his career and he uh, made those works very, very late um, towards almost some of his last editions, uh, mainly because they were really technically difficult to achieve. Um, those are actually done on a uh, aluminum uh, base, mm -hmm. which is then painted, screen printed with both ink and vinyl. Um, yeah. And those silver sections you see are actually swirled and polished stainless steel. Wow. Uh, and that sort of that upside down bridge you can see at the top is actually the reflection of what would have been a Japanese bridge in one of Monet's gardens. Um, and so really just amazing works. Uh, amazing. Furthermore, the, the, the metal really adds to the work in that it changes almost anywhere you view them because it's picking up on its surrounding. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's sort of the idea of, of a pond or a lake um, and really picking up and, and breathing. Who else do you like? Who else do I like? I do have a bit of an urban sensibility. Um, at Artnet, I was got was fortunate enough to work with uh, a lot of urban artists. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, Banksy, Shepard Fairey, uh, Cause, although he doesn't really carry the label as much, mm -hmm. um, and many others. Uh, and then you know, the truth with art is there's no limit to who and what you can collect. You know, most of the artists that I'm, I'm most interested in and have at home uh, are somewhat unknown right now, but hopefully uh, we can change that. Talk about the Julian Opie behind you. Sure, so this is a, uh, a print that came out last year uh, at Freeze New York. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, a, a print always just means that it's an edition, right? 
a multiple mm -hmm. can be an addition that's three dimensional. Um, right. And these works are actually a laser cut paper that's laid down onto more paper and then screen printed. So it may be hard to see the effect there, but uh, they're really three dimensional works, much like the water lilies, much like many of the, the, yeah. the Western steel cuts, many of the works we've discussed. I, I kind of love that tangible feel to an artwork. Um, and they're, you know, Opie's most famous for um, sort of paring down figurative works to their most minimal, um, most precise details. Mm -hmm. And uh, these, again, a laser cut technique uh, that really leads to a, a beautifully finished end result. Yeah, no, that's great. So um, what else can we talk about? Like, how do you work on the business side? Obviously, you know, you are selling and, and curating beautiful things all the, all the time, but how do you work? How, talk about the business side of how the gallery system works. Sure, sure. So uh, the first thing to note, I would say, is that there are two main types of galleries, which are primary galleries and secondary galleries. So primary galleries are really focused on a, a stable of artists that they represent um, and are working with to, you know, get their work shown, get them in the conversation and really uh, promoting their work mm -hmm. versus a secondary market gallery, much like myself and, and, and many others are more working with artists that they enjoy, but are dealing with work that has already been sold on its second, third or hundredth hand. It doesn't really uh, make a difference. Um, and in doing that are more involved with collectors and collections themselves um, and curating on that end. So really seeing that, you know, somebody who's really interested in a particular movement is able to collect that in depth and we're able to look at a collection and say, you know, you could really use something representing this facet or this time period or what have you, or even helping those with a very eclectic collection who would like to have something that speaks to each member of a family or, or each right. movement that they've, they've been interested in. We, yeah, we hadn't planned to talk about this on the call, but I think for just, you know, basic education for people, you know, you have an artist who is creating work that's trying to sell it, right? They can sell it directly to a collector. If a gallery signs them and picks them up, then a gallery, you know, there's one, like you were just saying, there are galleries that work with living artists and to promote their work. And then there, there are galleries like, like Alex's that deal in, in work from the secondary, you know, secondary market that are trading in the market uh, and that have been owned, you know, multiple times by other collectors. So the, the business of the art world is so diverse and, and obviously so necessary for all of us to continue doing what we're doing. Um, talk about the, again, the virtual show that you have coming up, because I want to hear about the highlights from that show. Sure. So um, firstly, we, we have a show coming up uh, that's going to be a virtual exhibition. Um, the working title was In Bloom, I, and uh, the idea was sort of a, a twist on, you know, a spring flower show, um, sort of with what's going on and, you know, the whole pandemic and really just the idea of exploring re rebirth, regrowth, uh, rejuvenation, and sort of seeing how that's been uh, depicted throughout art history. Um, and so we have works ranging probably o over a hundred years um, and, and different depictions of Amazing. that type of. So who yeah. are some of the names gonna, that are gonna be in the show? Uh, everything from, you know, we have some Kusama works, uh, some Joan Mitchell works, some really, some great works by strong female artists, which are, you know, getting a, a lot more attention uh, and their due respect these days. Mm -hmm. um, all the way up to younger works by artists like Jonas Wood, who's sort of a mid-career uh, artist who's quite well known for his depictions of um, pots and flowers and, and uh, mm -hmm. that has a nice touch of that blooming, beautiful uh, feel to it. There are some questions. So I wanted to, to transition to some of your questions, you guys. Uh, one question is, you mentioned a lot of the work you have at home are unknown artists. What are you looking for or what draws you to collect an emerging artist's work? Sure. Um, so, I mean, in general, collecting art, right, there's, there's a, a few different things to touch on. Um, there's, as you mentioned, the, the investment value. Um, there's also the aesthetic value and there's also sort of the emotional value. So I think when I'm drawn to something by an emerging artist, it's because I, I really feel a connection to it. And it's something that 
that you really want to live with and, and breathe every day, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, I, I always joke, uh, you know, you grow over time and your, your collection does as well. So I think, um, you know, my collection has matured from bachelorhood to now, you know, being a father and kind of yeah. switching things out um, and just looking yeah. for works that really speak to me and my family and, you know, works that we just enjoy waking up to. Well, and that's a good point. There's some other really good questions I'm going to get to in a second, but that's a really good point because you can, you can buy a piece of art and if your life changes, as long as you've done your due diligence, especially on the print market, um, you can resell that work um, at a later time and then pour that money into something else. Uh, Mitchell has a question. Is it a good time to purchase at a low price point? Um, I would say that uh, the art market is fairly resilient, at least when it comes to uh, blue chip artists. Um, mm -hmm. So, for example, you know, we, we talked about Warhol. I, I bought a few Warhols this week for the gallery. You know, things seem to be trading kind of as they always have been or mm -hmm. uh, equal to what they were before the pandemic. But I do think that there are always deals to be had and, you know, working with advisors and collection managers and whatnot. I, I am seeing some deals come onto the market, um, but I do think the market takes time to absorb uh, yeah. what's going on. If, Can you, you say, at, speaking of advisors, like how do you work with advisors like myself? Just let everybody know how that process works. Sure. Um, well, often, oftentimes advisors are the, the sort of in-between that are, curating collections for, for, you know, first time or long time collectors mm -hmm. um, and reaching out to galleries to see what they have that fits their clients needs. Um, so, I mean, we spoke yesterday about a client, uh, won't share too much, but um, you know, you had a specific place in mind and you're able to reach out to your network of galleries that you work with uh, and really find something that fits perfectly within the budget, within the aesthetic, Mm -hmm. And like we said, the, something that the client will have a, a good emotional attachment to um, and making sure that uh, the due diligence is done. Yeah. So the question I'll share, the question was, for example, I have a client that in one of their homes, they want to have um, a print series, one portfolio over their bed. Right. So they want to have, I don't know, say a set a portfolio of 10 works from this portfolio over the headboard and down the sides of um, each side of the bed. So I would have a conversation, I'd reach out to my network and like Alex and I talked yesterday and I said, hey, this is the budget, you know, whatever it is, you know, anywhere from 50 to $100,000, like, you know, what, what can you come up with that would be reasonable and he will source his inventory and I, that's, that's the kind of conversation I would have. And then, you know, I would negotiate the price with him and then I would do the due diligence. So I, I do all of the, the grunt work basically <laughs> for the Thank client for and, um, and helping to source it. So it adds value. So that's how I, how I make money is I, you know, do the, do the due diligence and negotiate the best price and then charge a fee based on the lowest price to negotiate. So thank well, you for talking I, I about think that. it's a bit more than that because I would say most advisors in the long run, at least end up saving clients quite a bit, um, just not only through leveraging their, their connections, but also through making sure that the right work is acquired at the right price that no one's, you know, overpaying or making sure that you're picking up on artists that have a, a promising future or, you know, yeah, many different things. Well, there's so many layers, you know, like we could work at a look at a work or a portfolio and maybe that portfolio was owned by a prominent trustee of a major institution or a prominent, you know, art collector. So that in itself can add value. So that's the kind of inside inside uh, information or due diligence that, that we can talk about and they can share with the client. Um, I want to talk more about like art as an investment because, you know, obviously you should buy art because you like it and it makes you happy. And especially now being, being at home more than ever, people really want to beautify their spaces. But talk a little bit about art as an investment from your perspective. Sure. Um, well, I would say that, you know, for me, art always has to, or should always tick uh, kind of multiple of those boxes. Um, and so there's no reason you can't find something that you absolutely adore. Um, mm -hmm. That is a good investment as well. Right. So it's, it's, I think, you know, once you start hitting a certain price point, you start getting to the five and six figures, you know, you really should be working with someone who's ensuring that 
you know, it's not just something that fits your space and is beautiful, but really has uh, a life of its own and, and hopefully uh, something that will hold its value or appreciate in value. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, that's kind of most of what I do um, is I'm, I'm dealing with only blue chip uh, secondary artists um, and yeah. really, you know, not to, not to bring it down to a commercial level, but, you know, once you hit all the other boxes, you really want to make sure that you're buying something at the right price that you kind of can sort of see where things are trading and where you expect them to be trading. Yeah. And have you seen um, any sectors uh, or, or specific names, for example, that are more valued right now or more have taken maybe a hit or there's more of an opportunity for people if they're kind of on the sidelines thinking about getting into the art market? Sure. Um, so I'd say firstly, in terms of who's being more valued now, you know, some of the names we, we mentioned earlier, uh, the, the, the Ninth Street or uh, the second gen uh, abstract expressionist artists like Joan Mitchell, uh, Frankenthaler um, mm -hmm. are really getting their, their due right now. So you've seen those prices really appreciate and I'm sure many advisors and mm -hmm. many galleries like myself kind of saw them as undervalued and had been buying them for years. Um, and other sectors where I see room for, for growth, little movements within the, you know, like I said, urban art, I, I always think is undervalued. I think that speaks more to a younger generation. Mm -hmm. um, yes, Cause and Banksy have kind of gone nuts, but I, I still think there's plenty of amazing artists who, who are just not on people's radar right now. Yeah. Um, what have you been doing during quarantine? How are you spending your days? Uh, I am uh, a full-time father, so yeah. I'm, you know, a business how is that? aside. How's, how is fatherhood? It's it's been amazing to be uh, home <laughs> home with the kids all day is uh, a dream. Um, so between that and you know just regular business, speaking with collectors and clients all day, um, and mixing that in, uh, it, it's been enjoyable. Mm -hmm. um, really a great time. How about you? How's uh, how's the left coast treating you? You know, it's been good. I mean, being isolated, I mean, at least I can walk outside. I mean, I, I really feel for the people in New York that that have more difficulty getting outside there. Um, but overall, it's been great. I mean, we had a few weeks of rain and we now we have, it's warm. It's very hot here, actually. It's going to be really hot in the next couple of days. Um, but overall, I mean, I'm really happy to be here. I mean, the my neighbors have been great and super friendly and you know the beaches now are all closed um i went surfing for my birthday like last week in santa barbara because the manhattan beach and uh venice beach were closed and i was gonna go with my instructor this weekend and sneak out and go because the beaches were still open there and now he told me he said no they're closed the governor's closing those beaches there which i think is great but um yeah people are being really respectful and social distancing and you know, here we have the, the luxury of just jumping in our car and and there's already a space between people um, naturally here. And it's going to be interesting to see how life how life changes. You know, I miss I miss the human interaction. I'm grateful for opportunities like this to connect with with old friends like you. Thank you for having and, me. Yeah. And uh, you guys, if you um, want any follow up information, feel free to reach out to to Alex or myself, we're happy to answer those questions. And um, yeah, I'd like to you know, do this again with you because it's really informative for people um, and helpful. So thank you for your time, Alex. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Kipton. All right. All the best to you. All right. Looking forward I'll talk to seeing you soon, my friend. All right. All right. Thanks, everyone.